My guest today is Thomas Sowell, the Rose and Milton Friedman Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He is the author of numerous books, including Basic Economics, Knowledge and Decisions, and A Conflict of Visions. His latest book, and our topic for today, is Economic Facts and Fallacies. Dr. Sowell, welcome to Econ Talk. Ah, oh, thank you. Now, your latest book, Economic Facts and Fallacies, is full of interesting data and arguments refuting some of the most common fallacies we hear all too often. I'd like to talk about a few of them today. Uh, the first is the area of what is called uh, income distribution or standard of living in a more uh, benign uh, description. A lot of people believe that the standard of living of the average American is no higher than it was, say, 35 years ago. True or false? False. Why? Well, uh, if, you, if, you, if we look just at the consumption figures, that's the easiest way that the uh, consumption has gone up by a very substantial amount over that whole period. I don't know how uh, you can say that the standard of living is the same if the consumption has gone up. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why people are able to uh, claim that the standard of living hasn't gone up. One of the most common is that uh, they use statistics on household incomes. And the problem with that is that households, have been declining in size over time. Uh, households also differ from uh, one uh, group to another, from one income bracket to another, and so on. Uh, personally, I, I'm just, uh, I find it maddening that people insist on that, on using household statistics, when, if, when a household can mean very different numbers of people, whereas individual income always means one person's income. And, if you, and for example, over a period of about 30 years, uh, the uh, average household income in the United States only rose by about 6%. But over that very same period of time, the per capita income rose by 51%. So that uh, the, the per capita income really gives you a more, uh, a more meaningful figure than the household income. Well, one of your themes throughout the book is the failure to compare apples to apples. It's often used in these statistical analyses. In the case of the household income, it's not just that, say, people might have fewer children today than they had 30 years ago. It's that the divorce rate rose very steeply in the early 70s, and a lot of single-person households were created. And as you point out, the bottom 20% of the household distribution has twice as many people as the top 20%, which seems impossible. Surely the bottom fifth and the top fifth should have the same number of people. But they it, don't. <laughs> no, I think it's the other way around. Uh, that, that is, the top 20% of households has... Oh, sorry, correct. We're, sorry, I said that wrong. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, this, uh, the latest figures I saw, there were 39 million people in the bottom 20% of household and uh, 64 billion people, if I recall, in the top, which means there's a difference of 25 million people in what are supposed to be equal percentages of households which are equal percentages of households, but not equal percentages of people. One of the problems is that the, 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 the tendency to look at statistical categories as if you're talking about flesh and blood human beings. In terms of flesh and blood human beings, uh, these, these quintiles that they love to cite don't contain the same number of people. And so it's misleading to compare, say, the standard of living of one group to the other. Obviously, we don't have perfect, we don't have perfect equality, but... Um, you also talk about the role of uh, prices in that comparison over time and having to deflate uh, nominal income variables. So measured income in one period is higher, but of course there's been inflation. But if inflation's inaccurately measured, you're not going to get an equal, uh, the correct measuring stick. Uh, that's right. And the, the big problem there is that uh, what seems quite reasonable that you would take a, a, a list of uh, common commodities and track their prices over time. Uh, the problem with that is that as new commodities come online, they're typically extremely expensive at first. And then as time goes on and there's mass production and people learn new technologies, then the price comes down. And so now you only include those commodities after the prices have come down. And so you've never counted them as the, as the prices were coming down. The classic example, I think, would be video cassette recorders, which I think uh, debuted at about $30,000 a piece. And now you can get them for a couple of hundred. Now, 
The um, critics of your viewpoint, and it's a viewpoint I share, by the way, uh, that uh, the standard of living is dramatically higher. The, the critics of that viewpoint often will say the following, well, sure, incomes are higher, people have more consumption, but they struggle to get by. And and they just <laughs> they just can't seem to make ends meet, and and I've actually seen semi serious people, at least people that get quoted in the newspaper, saying the problem is is that our incomes just aren't high enough uh, to to meet our our, our needs. So well, listen, what, I, I feel like I need a digital Hasselblad, which costs about thirty thousand dollars, and uh, my income is just not big enough to meet that need without some real sacrifices. Uh, the question is whether that means the taxpayer should be forced to buy me a digital Hasselblad or not. Uh, I hear this talk about how people can't make ends meet. Uh, that's why, for example, uh, there have to be two uh, pa- uh, people working in the Correct. same family and so on. Well, it depends upon where the uh, ends are supposed to meet. I mean, if people of a generation or two ago were living as high on the hog as people are today, you would not only have to have the father and mother both working, you'd have to have the children out there working in order to pay for all that. So it, it's, uh, it, it's trying to treat as a, um, an objective fact well, what is nothing more than a personal choice. Uh, you see that in, in colleges and universities where they say, you know, we have to raise the tuition because costs have risen. Well, by cost, they mean they have chosen uh, to spend more money. Yeah, on dorms or faculty salaries or whatever they happen to choose. Uh, the other argument you hear sometimes is that, uh, true, we have more stuff, but that's because we were all in debt. Any truth to that? Not that I know of, because eventually uh, we have to pay off the debts or, or else people will stop giving us credit. Yeah, they kind of forget about that. And then, of course, now and then people do overextend themselves. But uh, I think you made the point in basic economics that we always want more than we have. Uh, that's human nature. Our, our, need, our desires, not our needs, we don't have any needs really, but our desires are, are always greater than what we can afford. And so by our human nature, we tend to uh, struggle to get by. Um, but as you point out, we could certainly work at our current levels of productivity. We could work about two-thirds as hard as we work now and live as well as we did 50 years ago, but people evidently don't want to live that well. They want to live a lot better. That's right. I mean, I, I, I find it amazing. I hear complaints about the difficulty of getting pizza delivered in some neighborhoods. And I think, you know, when I was growing up, the very thought that you would have somebody cook your food for you <laughs> and deliver it to you at home would never have occurred to 90% of the people in the country. Maybe the rich would have caterers or something like that. But uh, it's amazing how long people got by without, without that particular service. I really enjoy uh, the care with which you use language, uh, both as a writer and a thinker. And one of the phrases that you criticize related to our current topic is the phrase distribution of income. It's a phrase you hear all the time, and I confess I use it myself now and then. Uh, Reading your book reminds me to try to cut that phrase out of my vocabulary. But you don't like that phrase. Why is that? What do you find misleading and deceptive about it? Well, well, first of all, most income isn't distributed in the first place. But what, what it does, it, it allows people to act as if society, quote unquote, is in the act of distributing income. Uh, and that if you don't like the way the distribution turns out now, we should just simply have society distribute it differently. Well, first of all, there is nobody named society. Uh, second, second of all, there is no um, uh, centralized uh, decision as to how much each person ought to get. Uh, that's decided by the person to whom you pr- perform, or for whom you perform some service or give, or produce some product. And that person, I think, is far better qualified to say how much that is worth to that person than anybody else it would be. And certainly there's nobody wise enough or even knowledgeable enough to be able to decide for all the 300 million people in this country uh, how much each person ought to get by some arbitrary rule. Right, but the, I think what uh, people have in mind, and it is a fallacy, is that the system, and that's a vague word that covers a lot of territory, the system is designed, which isn't true, but it has pieces that are tinkered with by policymakers, and therefore, because there's tinkering, the outcomes must be intended by someone. But of course, that is not true. And it leads people to then ask, I think incorrectly, 
well, we have to re-tinker with it to make it fairer, more equitable, whatever is the, the goal that that person wants. That's right. What, what, what they're, acting at, they're doing is acting as if there's a current set of, of uh, central decisions that we don't like and we ought to have a different set of central decisions. The more fundamental problem is we do not have a set of central decisions that uh, uh, how much I'm paid is determined by uh, how many people buy my books, uh, how many people read my columns, and so forth. Uh, and and, and to, to argue that there ought to be some politicians in Washington deciding how much everybody in the country is really worth, whatever that means, uh, is to change to a radically different system. And if people want that radically different system, I think they ought to come out openly and explain why that way of determining incomes would be better and what we do now, instead of acting as if society is doing this and society ought to do that. Of course, you are underpaid. Your books Absolutely. are not. Aren't we all? Yeah, your books are not well, well read enough, I don't think, or appreciated sufficiently. And obviously, something ought to be done about that. That's my small contribution here, we, we hope. So you're not as worried, uh, in the book at least, and I think in this conversation, about, say, uh, the high levels of, uh, of CEO pay that get uh, draw a lot of political attention? I am far more worried about the political attention than I am about the CEO's pay. Why? I'm, well, one is I, I've never paid a CEO, so I have no way of knowing. I must be the last person in the country who doesn't know what CEOs ought to be paid. <laughs> uh, but, but more than that, uh, uh, the utter inconsistency of that argument is amazing. Uh some numbers I saw a while back said that the average CEO of uh, uh, of companies big enough to be in Standard and Poor's 500 was a little over eight million dollars a year. That's about one third uh, less, to one one third rather of what uh, Alex Rodriguez gets for playing third base for the Yankees. Uh, it's something like uh, my gosh, one eightieth of what Oprah Winfrey gets. I don't know why there, there, there's not such an uproar about Alex Rodriguez or Oprah Winfrey as there is about CEOs. Uh, it's wholly arbitrary, like so many things that are supposed to be a matter of principle. Uh, and and the, other, the other thing is that uh, the people who do know what, what, what the CEO's value to the company is are the ones who pay them. And it's their money, and they have every uh, incentive not to pay more than they have to. Or sometimes not their money. The, the you know the compensation uh, committee of a of a board of directors may not have the accountability that it, that would be in a in a different. That's organization. true. That's true. But as a general as a general explanation, though, the problem with that is that um, if you divide corporations into those where um, decisions are made uh, by some board uh, for other people for third parties, they're spending other people's money essentially. And you compare that with the uh, pay of CEOs in companies where a few large uh, financial institutions own the company. I think Hertz is one of those, or Avis, I forget which it is. Uh, the pay of CEOs is the highest uh, in those places where uh, small numbers of financial institutions uh, are, are deciding what to pay and are spending their own money. Because they understand that you know there's no point being penny-wise and pound-foolish when you've got billions of dollars at stake. I like the Alex Rodriguez point, um, although I'm a Red Sox fan. I can look at him somewhat dispassionately, and, and I actually believe he's an extraordinarily productive uh, baseball player. And I think it's wonderful that many Yankee fans don't appreciate him and complain about him all the time. But I, you know, you could go either way with your observation. You could be encouraging people to complain about his salary. Some people do, of course. But I, why do you think it is that we – idolize the Oprah Winfrey's and, and great athletes, uh, at least who have better press than, than Alex Rodriguez. Why do we idolize those folks? We don't resent movie stars' salaries. We don't resent that they make a lot of money. In fact, it kind of adds to the excitement of following them around, taking their picture. Yeah. And yet CEOs become um, disdained and, and, and greedy. What, what's, the, what's the story there? Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I, I suspect that it has a lot to do with the fact that corporate CEOs are among those or the corporations in general are among those who stand in the way of people who think that they ought to be deciding what society as a whole is doing. The, the, the movie stars and the athletes don't really represent that kind of competing uh, elite. 
uh, and so therefore they don't care how many millions these these uh, uh, athletes and entertainers get. Uh, but if they what they really want is to get at these corporate people who who uh, I mean as long as there are private corporations, uh, uh, the left is never going to be able to have the kind of economy that they want run according to the way they think economies ought to be run. And I think part of it is the fallacy you point out early on in the book, uh, which runs uh, throughout and in a couple various different places, which is the zero-sum fallacy that anybody getting ahead must be coming at someone's expense. I think, tragically, a lot of people look at corporate profits as as exploitation of consumers. And similarly, they have this weird idea that that corporate pay, CEO pay, uh, comes at someone's expense, that the shareholders, the, the, the workers, the consumers – but as you point out, no one says that about pilots' salaries. No one says that the pilot of the airplane is somehow exposing, uh, exploiting the uh, the passengers by by drawing a salary. It's a great point. Yeah. Well, again, pilots, you see, are really no threat to the vision that people have of, of a society in which uh, some elites, intellectuals or whatever, activists, uh, uh, are able to uh, do things the way they want them done. Let's turn to inequality more generally. Uh, you have some wonderful observations about uh, race and sex uh, inequalities, differences between black and white economic outcomes and male and female economic outcomes. Um, you particularly uh, are particularly eloquent when you say, what reason was there to expect these groups to be the same in the first place? So we have all these comparisons that we see in the in the media typically about so and this group's income being a fraction of that group's income. Why are those group comparisons so misleading? Because the groups themselves, basically what you've already quoted, that uh, there was never any reason to expect the groups to be the same in the first place. One of the simplest differences among groups, age. Uh, group, groups in the United States and in other countries around the world uh, often differ from each other by, by a whole decade in age. And income varies enormously by, by age. People who are 40 years old are usually make a lot more money than people who are 20 years old. I mean, a lot of people who are 40 years old have 20 years of experience. Uh, nobody who's 20 years old has 20 years of experience. You know, so, uh, the, the, again, something just very mundane, and yet uh, the, the, those differences are, are, are very important. Um, if you look at cultures, and I have a trilogy on uh, race and culture, uh, the cultures are all very different. They're different even across racial lines. That is, uh, it was pointed out for long, long before people were concerned about black-white differences that white Southerners and white Northerners had very large differences in things like literacy, uh, violence, rates of illegitimacy, etc. All the things which today people point out as differences between blacks and whites uh, nationwide were pointed out before the Civil War. Uh, as differences between black, uh, white Southerners and white Northerners. Now, blacks were in the culture of, of, of the Southern whites, and you can see uh, many of the things that are, are now pointed out as peculiar to blacks, including what is called black English, was already there in the South among the whites. And moreover, uh, it was in those people and their ancestors as far back as in Britain and centuries earlier. So the, 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 no, no group is without a culture. And there's no reason in the world that all these cultures should be the same and lots of reasons why they have to be different. And education, of course, is different. Oh, absolutely. And we measure but, education so crudely. Usually in our statistical analyses as economists, it's just years of education, as if that somebody went to school, say, to college for two years is the same as everyone else who went to school for two years, regardless of what they studied. Yes, or how well they did in it. Right, or how well they did in it. Yeah, separate problem. I, I forgot about that one. Uh, what are some of the other uh, important differences in the in the in the differences between male and female uh, earnings? You make some very uh, pointed observations about the ch differences in experience. Oh well, for, for one thing, uh, women of a given age tend to have fewer years of uh, consecutive employment than men of the same age. Uh, I mean, the most obvious difference between men and women is that women have babies and men don't, uh, and that's not a small thing. And it's not of small importance, otherwise the human race would die out. It's one of the rare empirical observations that I think is, is um, pretty uh, ironclad. It's hard to argue with that one. Yes, but, but it, it's, 
it's very different from understanding a particular fact and understanding the implications of the fact. Uh, someone pointed out, you know, Newton wasn't the first man who saw an apple fall. He was just the first man who understood the implications of it. That's a great point. So in the case of women, what I, what I like is that you, you don't just make that observation that women have different experience patterns. You show that the gaps between male and female earnings are, are much smaller when women are, quote, more like men in their experience patterns, correct? Oh, ab- ab- absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, there's really ve- very little uh, uh, income difference today between men and women who are uh, uh, comparable in, across the, law, the whole range of things that matter. For example, uh, education, meaning not only the number of years, but also the fields of specialization, um, uh, years of consecutive employment, uh, and, and many women uh, t- take out some years when they, after they have children before they return full-time to the labor force. Well, that has an impact. Uh, the, the, the choice of uh, fields matters also because if women know that they're going to have to stay, stay out of the labor force for a few years, then it matters whether you're in an occupation where you can stay out a few years, come back and, and resume, or you're in an occupation where the occupation itself is changing so profoundly and so fast that when you come back five years later, uh, you, you're at a huge disadvantage uh, where there's been, for example, technological change or in the law where the, where the uh, laws on uh, taxes or whatever have changed tremendously since, since the last time you practiced law and are going to keep on changing. And so now you've got to step in, catch up with everything that happened during those five years, and then still keep up with the new changes that are going on. Uh, military technology, computer technology, and so forth. Uh, all those things uh, make, make it uh, um, uh, rational for women to pick an entirely different uh, mix of occupations than those that men pick. Uh, you know, my wife uh, took time off from work to uh, be at home with our four kids, and as they've gotten older, they're she's starting to get back into the labor force and she is a math teacher mm-hmm. and geometry and algebra haven't changed much uh, That's right. in the last uh, eight to 10 years. Although there are fads in how they're taught, I have to say, which uh, mm-hmm. she's going to have to reacquaint herself with, I suspect as she gets more, more involved, but presumably uh, women who choose fields that are more uh, uh, dynamic, such as medicine or the technological fields you mentioned, uh, presumably, they spend l- they choose to spend less time out of the labor force when they do have children, or they choose not to have children. That's right. That's right. But the point you're making, which I think is the profound one, is that what we observe as some something that looks like occupational segregation, uh, which has a pejorative sound to it, need not be pejorative. It could merely be the choices that people make freely. There's also the question of, of hours of work as well. And the predictability of the work, uh, as I mentioned in the book, uh, lawyers, for example, if you're if you're an attorney for some major uh, on national or international law firm, and uh, there's suddenly a, a multi-billion-dollar lawsuit uh, uh, springing up at one of, at one of the branches, uh, you know, five thousand miles away, and you're the expert on that field, then you're just going to have to go five thousand miles away on short notice and stay there until such time as that lawsuit gets settled. Uh, if, if you're an attorney who's defending uh, someone who's about to be uh, executed a week from now, you know, and, uh, uh, and the judge has allowed you to have a, a last-ditch uh, meeting uh, in three days to say why he should stay the execution, I mean, you, you, you can't go home at 5 o'clock uh, and, and, you know, take the kids out playing soccer on a weekend. You've got to start suddenly uh, spending 16 hours a day or whatever uh, putting together the best case you possibly can so that your client doesn't get executed. And uh, those, th- those are very tough things to do for a, uh, for, for a mother uh, who has children. Uh, I have some personal experience along these lines in that I was a single parent between marriages. And, you know, uh, the, the, the longest period between two of my books occurred during that period. I mean, it was five years between books uh, because I, I had other things to do. I hope it was a good investment anyway. Although it didn't get you closer to that Hasselblad, I could see that. <laughs> no, no, I'd, I'd have a Hasselblad today <laughs> except for that. Um, what about discrimination? 
a lot of people look at the disparate uh, outcomes for different groups, uh, men and women, blacks and whites, other comparisons, and they conclude it's discrimination. Is there uh, anything to that? Oh, there, discrimination is one of a number of factors which, which can explain uh, differences in a particular case. But, of course, the uh, case has to be, the, the uh, analysis has to be for that particular case. You can't just make a blanket assumption that that's what it is. Uh, my gosh, I, one of the things that really annoys me considerably in, in these black-white comparisons, and sometimes black-white-Hispanic comparisons, is that so often, I would say most of the ones that I've seen, they leave out Asian Americans, even when there are data on Asian Americans uh, and we're from wherever they're citing their data on blacks and whites. And, and, and if you included the data on Asian Americans, it would really make the case collapse like a house of cards in a lot of cases. For example, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how uh, blacks don't get approved for conventional mortgage loans as often as whites. Uh, blacks have to resort to subprime loans uh, more often than whites. Uh, blacks are more likely to be laid off during a downturn than whites. Now, that, 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 that sounds very persuasive until you throw in the data on Asian Americans. Uh, whites get turned out for conventional loans more often than Asian Americans. Uh, whites have to resort to subprime loans more often than Asian Americans. Uh, whites get it laid off during a downturn more often than Asian Americans. Now, if you took seriously the argument that these racial disparities uh, show discrimination, you would end up with the absurd con conclusion that the white employers and the white lenders are all discriminating against white workers and white consumers. Uh, but you can't just uh, uh, pick and choose when you're going to consider uh, evidence uh, seriously and when you're not going to consider it seriously. A lot of people attribute the progress of, of black Americans and and women as well, to various anti-discrimination laws. Uh, is, that, is that a good idea? Is that true? Well, it, the, the, it, it doesn't fit either the history or the economics. Um, if, you, if you trace with women uh, the periods in which they were doing well and which they were not doing well, uh, most people are unaware that women in the first couple of decades of the 20th century were doing much better relative to men than they were, say, in, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and and, and it's, it's no great mystery as to how that came about, uh, that as women's age of marriage began coming down and, and they started having children at earlier and earlier ages, particularly the baby boom being the climax of that, uh, obviously they weren't able to, to get postgraduate education or college education in many cases, and therefore, they were not eligible for the higher level uh, jobs that they'd held in earlier times. So if you compare uh, in a number of fields, including economics, uh, what percentage of people were women, say, in 1930 as compared to 1950, it was more in 1930. Interesting. Uh, law, other fields. Uh, uh, and, but, but as the age of marriage came down, as they had more children, they declined. Uh, now, the people who argue the other way uh, avoid all that by the simple practice of starting their discussion in the 1960s as if the world were created in the 1960s. And then they show that women rose. Well, actually, women started rising around the middle of the 1950s uh, because the age of marriage started rising again around that time. And you can just plot this on a graph, and you can see the uh, uh, almost mirror images when you compare, compare the age of uh, first marriage uh, and the level of women in professional occupations. And so as women now began to arise by about 1972 and, and the professional fields, they got, got back to where they had been in 1932. And then as the age of marriage grows to just uh, unprecedented levels and more and more women didn't get married at all, uh, then you begin to see women rise in these areas. But it has very little correlation with affirmative action or with uh, anti-discrimination laws. Why should age of marriage be so important? Oh, because the age of marriage uh, usually also uh, ties in with the age at which women start having children. Um, my, f my first thought would be it might be better to have your children young, and then you could have an uninterrupted period of investment in human capital. But is that not the case? Well, the, the different women make different uh, uh, decisions on this. But the point is that the, uh, that the marriage age and the childbearing age... Uh, 
have, have a profound effect on them. If you look at those women who were never married, you know, that's that's where it's that's one effect about you know, yeah. You, you see that they in the academic world they were doing better than men. Uh, oh gosh, almost thirty years ago. And what about for the racial differences? Uh, a lot of people attribute the progress of Black Americans to uh, Civil Rights Act, other anti discrimination law, et cetera. Well, you you can make that case when it comes to elected officials that after the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the number of black elected officials uh, just uh, skyrocketed. Uh, but when you move into other things, uh, incomes and occupations, uh, the, purport, the, the percentage of blacks who were in poverty uh, declined uh, from 87% back in 1940 to, 30, to a 47% in 1960. And that was before there were any civil rights laws of any consequence. Um, and the, the, the long-term trend of blacks in poverty was down. Uh, it continued through the 60s, but it wasn't accelerated at all. And, and after about 19, uh, seven, and by 1970, it wasn't accelerated even uh, worth talking about. Uh, think- so none of those things really is correlated with, with how blacks have uh, either come out of poverty or have risen into uh, professional occupations and so on. Yeah, I think that... That uh, flattening of the poverty rate, which had been falling mm-hmm. before, uh, really cuts across all groups, and it's overwhelmingly driven by uh, family structure. Uh, all groups actually, if you, if you look across all races, poverty rates fall through the 70s and 80s and 90s if you hold family structure constant. So if you only look at a particular kind of family, a parent, two-parent family, it's, mm-hmm. it starts, it's very low, the poverty rate, but it, it continues to fall all through that, that, those 30 years, 70s, 80s, and 90s. If you look at single women, it continues to fall. If you look at single women with children, it continues to fall. The problem is, is that the proportion of all families that are single women with kids explodes over that period. And as a result, the overall poverty rate basically stays flat, even though every single type of family is getting less poor. It's a very, uh, it's a paradox statistically for people, but uh, I suspect that's part of what's going on in the black numbers. Uh, yes, the the, uh, the the figure that struck me in doing the research was that uh, the poverty rate for black married couples was has been in single digits since 1994. Yeah. And uh, so the, the argument that the po- black poverty is due to racism really falls apart because the people don't change their uh, race when they get married. Uh, and, and yet, uh, if you look at blacks uh, who, who, in, in the ghetto with a the, the single mother and all of that, the poverty rate is just huge. Yeah, that's a big handicap. Any thoughts on why equality is so appealing to human beings? The idea that especially the, the measured equality that we often use to assess the fairness of capitalism, say, or a particular economic system, people look at measured outcomes, as you point out, with all of these flaws where we wouldn't expect equality, and yet um, they judge it uh, accordingly. Well, any thoughts on why that is? I, th- I think a certain amount of that is artificial in the sense that intellectuals have uh, been terribly preoccupied with this for a very long time. And insofar as they influence through the media and through educational institutions, how other people think about it, they, they keep pushing this. Theory. Uh, even many of the advocates of equality, I think of uh, R.H. Tawney in the 30s, uh, lamented that the general public didn't seem to be nearly as concerned about this as they do, as they are. Uh, and, and so the real question is, why are intellectuals so concerned about this? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I think that, again, it ties in with their notion that they ought to be deciding what society is like and the things that they don't understand shouldn't be allowed to to, to remain. It's like the argument about the, the corporate CEOs. Many, many uh, intellectuals have uh, said, you know, I don't see why a, why a corporate executive should be making so much money. Well, I don't see how why anybody should be making the money they do. I mean, why in the world would you imagine that you should be uh, aware of why corporate executives make that kind of money, uh, or, or why it should be any of your business? Yeah, I, I think it was um, I think it was Hayek who said, and I want to come back and ask you about Hayek later. But I, just as an aside, I think it was Hayek who explained his explanation for why intellectuals were more likely to be socialists than capitalists. Was a purely self-interested one, you know. For for those of us who are who are in favor of more decentralized decision making rather than centralized decision making, 
we have this embarrassment that it seems like the people with the high IQ tend to be the, the communists, the socialists, the so-called social democrats, the people who want more government. Mm. And Hayek's observation was, well, yeah, they'd have more power in those systems, so of course they're in favor of it. So that was a, um early public choice argument, which I've always found comforting. Yes, I, I, I think it's absolutely true. L- let's move on to a set of global issues that you talk about in the book. Uh, a lot of people blame European colonialism uh, for exploiting poor nations, leaving them poor, and use that as an indictment of, of typically what's called the West in uh, looking at the causes of world poverty, poor, particularly poor nations, a topic we've talked about recently on, on the show. Uh, what do you, what's your assessment of that colonialism argument? It's really uh, it's a triumph, I think, of, uh, of ideology over facts. That it, it, almost any uh, factual uh, assessment of a situation uh, would make this argument collapse like a house of cards. It's typically uh, the, the poorest places uh, in the world have typically been the places where the uh, uh, West has, has has paid little or no attention to them ever. Uh, uh, I think Lenin's uh, imperialism was absolutely a masterpiece in the art of propaganda because he managed to convince highly educated people all around the world of something for which he had no speck of evidence, uh, and, 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 and which all the evidence that was available pointed the other way. Uh, what was he arguing? Well, the, the argument was that the, uh, essentially that the, the West, uh, the industrialized countries, maintained their prosperity by exploiting the poorer countries. Uh, and and he, he has he has one of the great meretricious uh, diagrams uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in economics uh, to show this. Yeah, and he's only able to, to make this seem plausible by using huge uh, heterogeneous categories like the entire Western Hemisphere, that Europe invests in the Western Hemisphere, from which we're supposed to conclude that they are investing, you know, in the underdeveloped nations of the Western Hemisphere and so on. Right. Well, if you broke that down, you'd say, no, they're investing in the United States of America. At the height of the British Empire, they invested more in the United States than they invested in the whole British Empire. Uh, and even to this day, the United States is still the country in which most people, uh, most foreigners invest their money. Uh, but by having this very heterogeneous category of the Western Hemisphere and, this, and all this talk as if they're investing in Guatemala or Brazil or something, uh, he's able to maintain this. But what, but it also says how, how, how desperately people want to believe something like this. Well, it's convenient. It gives people a scapegoat for either uh, their own failings or it lets them blame someone that, that they'd like to put some blame on, I guess. And the other thing is that... Uh, well, and this has caused, it's more than just an intellectual problem. Um, and you see that by the end of the 20th century, these kinds of theories, like such as that of Lenin or dependency theory in Latin America, have faded away because more and more people became, uh, noticed the obvious fact that once very poor places like Hong Kong and Singapore, South Korea, suddenly have become very prosperous, and they did it by opening up to investment from the West, which supposedly is what impoverishes people. And the tragedy, if you look at a place like sub-Saharan Africa, the United States has practically nothing invested in southern, uh, sub-Saharan Africa compared to what it's invested in Canada, uh, much less Western Europe. Well, just think, think how rich Canada, Canada would be if we left them alone. Yes. I, <laughs> I guess that's the, uh, that, that's the argument there. But it is a strange argument, and it's... You're right, when I was... In high school, in the late 60s, early 70s, the evil American corporation, uh, United Fruit Company or, or oh, yeah. some other exploiting company, went down to these these poor countries and, and just took stuff, is the implication. They're just thieves. Mm. Uh, and today we have a similar version of that. It, you, you can't say that anymore. You're right. That that argument kind of died out. Instead, what it is is that you know Nike goes into... Indonesia and builds a shoe factory and pays low wages, and that makes these people as if the low wages they pay is what makes them poor. But that's right. That, that, that if in fact there were higher wages available in these countries, these people would never uh, take these jobs with Nike. In point of fact, uh, the data show that the multinational corporations uh, tend to pay about twice what the local wage rate happens to be. Now that's still a lot less than it is in the United States or in Western Europe. 
but they, they are definitely not impoverishing these people. Uh, I saw a piece in the New York Times a, few, a couple of years ago about some poor lady in, I think it was Cambodia, yes, uh, who was uh, working uh, in a, some, some garbage dump. Uh, she was a uh, scavenger. Yeah. How terrible conditions and how low her pay was. And, the, and then the uh, writer said, you know, it w- she would consider it a dream to be able to go work for a multinational corporation for $2 a day. Right. And then that people in these countries, in point of fact, uh, uh, often uh, pay uh, a, a, a month's salary to somebody on the inside who can get them a job because the jobs are that desirable given their alternatives. And I think one of the tragic things is that so many people who are on in these moralistic crusades never think in terms of the alternatives. I mean, I, I have a piece recently about child labor in India. Uh, I'm not happy that kids are working, uh, making the stuff, stuff in India. It's a tragedy. But the, but the question is, what are their alternatives? Yeah. Uh, I also think, too, that uh, one of the sad effects of... Uh, our own child labor laws is that we have a lot of kids out there selling dope in the street because uh, and, uh, who, who would who would be able to have legitimate jobs in a free market if we didn't have these child labor laws and the minimum wage laws? Uh, the child labor laws, when they were passed, were trying to stop pe- uh, kids from being used in coal mines and places like that. But today, we have strapping teenagers who are not allowed to work in air-conditioned offices on a computer because of the child labor laws. Yeah, they're they're. Uh, we want them in those very uh, those wonderful public schools that uh, teach them so well, get them so prepared. <laughs> yes. I mean, as you point out, I think somebody told me um, a former student of yours. I and I can't, can't. I apologize for not remembering who it was, or at least heard this from you. That that the essence of economics is asking, and then what? Uh, yeah. that, that something sounds good at the beginning, like higher wages for workers, either through a minimum wage or some campaign to pressure an international corporation to pay more. And, and those have good effects to, to some extent. Uh, the people who keep their jobs in those settings, are, their lives are improved. But you have to ask, and then what? What comes, what comes next? And what alternatives are people forced into, as you point out? Oh yeah, I I, th- I think that at least half the rhetoric of politicians, especially in late in uh, election year, uh, would have to disappear into thin air if people started asking what will be the actual consequence of this. Well, it's an interesting thing as to why people don't ask it more. I, part of it's a lack of understanding market forces and the you know the 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 consequences that are that economists see fairly easily or sometimes hard to see for people who are not trained in economics. But part of it, as I think you were referring to earlier, is that it's just not, it's more pleasant not to think of them. That's right. That, uh, I mean, I, I've been recently reading John Dewey, you know, a renowned philosopher, and yet he's talking about how uh, uh, under capitalism there's this artificial scarcity. Uh, and and he, it never occurred, and how we need to change the institutions, you see, to deal with that. And uh, he never asked the questions. Where do you find in this in the real world institutions world we live in. Yeah. That, that have uh, a greater abundance than you do in capitalist countries? Yeah, what did he have in mind there, you think? Oh, I, I think he had in mind socialism. Uh, all right, a worker's paradise. Th- yeah. That's it. Uh, very, uh, we're, we're talking on the day after uh, Castro appears to have stepped down uh, from leading the worker's paradise uh, just uh, south of Key West, Florida, called Cuba. And it's um, his uh, 50 or so year ex- experiment has not turned out to be much of a paradise. But they, they never judge these things by, by, by their factual outcomes. Uh, even in the days of the Soviet Union and, after the, after the, and even after they found out some of the terrible things that were going on, these were always called, these are the growing pains of a new society. But, uh, you know, when, uh, when, when uh, Pinochet took over in Chile, uh, they didn't say that, that the things that went wrong in Chile were just the growing pains of a new society. Yeah. You have to, it, to make an omelet, you have to crack eggs, but it only, it only counts in uh, certain kinds of omelets, I guess. Oh, yes. But it is, it is an incredible phenomenon. Uh, Ann Applebaum writes about it in uh, her book on the Gulag, where she talks about why, how strange it is that it's it's not polite to walk around in in uh, civil society wearing Nazi uh, regalia, but you're allowed to wear um, communist memorabilia is is considered hip, 
and I don't know if she refers to it, but a lot of people wear Che Guevara t-shirts. Oh, yes. And he's a murderer. Uh, and so it's just interesting how motive uh, washes away a lot of sins for people. Yes, I, I'm, I'm currently doing something I've been threatening to do for years, which is write a book about intellectuals. And uh, it is a puzzle as to how... They, they, they really have an enormous uh, virtuosity in the use of words. And I think it's a fatal talent because it can keep you from uh, facing realities. You can always find some clever way to uh, wish the reality away. It's going to be a, a many, a large, multi-volume series. <laughs> no. You need a lot of pages for that fatal I'm, I'm, attraction. I'm hoping to, to, to start a line of inquiry and leave it to someone <laughs> a lot younger to uh, finish it up. Uh, at one point, you talk about overpopulation, uh, something that many people consider a source of world poverty. Uh, and they consider a, both here in the United States, it's considered a source of, of overcrowding and and, um, and and problems in the cities. And worldwide, it's considered a, a source of, of, of poverty. But you reject that. Why? Uh, because the facts won't support it. Uh, and again, the, 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 the fundamental uh, uh, problem is that people don't even look at the facts. They, they say this, and that's the end of it. Uh, I, I think the Malthusian population theory is one of the wonders of the world, because it wasn't even true in Malthus's time. And, so, and Malthus was, in fact, forced into all kinds of redefinitions and so on in order to maintain the semblance of, of its being correct. But uh, I, I guess the quickest way to answer these people is to, is to ask them, name me a country uh, whose prosperity was greater when their population was half of what it is today. I don't think they can name a country anywhere in the world in which, which that's true. I think you're right. Uh, a related uh, error that people make, and it's a topic that we've been talking about recently here, is the role of natural resources. Uh, a lot of people like to say that, well, the United States got rich, uh, say, between 1776 and today because, well, it's a rich country. It has lots of raw materials uh, and that that's the road to wealth for a nation. And, and it fits in with the colonialism story, right, because it says that the reason some of these countries were poor is because the West stripped them of their, their wealth, these yeah. natural resources. But you um, show that doesn't meet the facts very well either. No, in fact, if you if you look at uh, countries like Venezuela and uh, Uruguay, uh, the natural resources per capita there uh, 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 is higher uh, than in uh, Japan or Switzerland, and yet the uh, uh, per capita income in Japan and Switzerland is some multiple of what it is in Uruguay uh, and Venezuela. Uh, if you look at a place like Saudi Arabia, for heaven's sake, with the, the world's leading oil producer, uh, their uh, per capita income is roughly half of that in Singapore, which is so lacking in natural resources that they have to import their drinking water from Malaysia. So it, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's people, it's not natural resources. Well, I was shocked by that Saudi Arabia number because I sort of had the impression that they were we, I think of Saudi Arabia as a wealthy country. I know it's a very unequal distribution of income. I know a small group at the top gets a lot of the goodies. Oh, yeah. It's a small country. Uh, there's a lot of sand there. It's not a big population country. It's a big physical space. But So I figured that, well, the, the per capita income would still be high, but it's not. Uh, no. And as you, I think, point out, and I checked this also, uh, Israel's standard of living is higher than Kuwait's. Israel has no oil. Um, Kuwait has oil. Uh to my surprise, looking at recent data on the web, uh, getting ready for this talk, the number one oil producer uh, in the world is Saudi Arabia. Yes. Uh, the number two right now, it varies, uh, is the United States, although the data weren't broken out easily to assess whether the United States was two or three. That shocked me, by the way, as well. Mm. Um, but the former USSR, the former Soviet Union, at least in December of 2007, produced a lot more oil than Saudi Arabia, and they are not doing well. So we're not going to say you – know, there's an argument, which I'm sympathetic to, that actual ha actually having natural resources isn't just neutral. It's bad for your uh, – A number living. of people have pointed that out. Uh, uh, Nigeria has, has a fair amount of, uh, of oil. But, you know, if you're spending your time shooting each other and instead of drilling for oil, it's not going to do you a lot of good. Right, and and if you have a big prize like a natural resource that you can funnel to your friends, uh, you tend to get bad government. And as you point out, bad government is is 
is a major factor in whether a nation is rich or poor, not whether it has natural resources or not. Yeah, the, the, the other thing that people don't realize, too, I think, is that what we call a natural resource uh, is not some objectively given thing. It's, it's, what, it's what people know how to use. I mean, uh, uh, uranium was not a natural resource a thousand years ago. Uh, because they, 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 they weren't that many uses for it. Uh, um, waterfalls were not a natural resource uh, before people had uh, uh, mills and later on uh, hydroelectric dams. They were a hazard. So it, huh? They That's were a hazard. Right. Oil, yes. as my colleague Don Boudreau likes to point out, uh, crude oil is just a sticky, gross substance until you figure out how to refine it. Well, at one time, before oil became uh, what it is today, uh, uh, shysters would foist off land onto, peop- onto unsuspecting people when they knew that the land had oil on it because they knew that the, that, that, that would reduce the value of the land. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, of course, once the, the, the uses were found, some people who had, in fact, been snookered found themselves very wealthy. Yeah, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great example. Well, I want, to, I want to change gears a little bit. We've got, a, we've got a few minutes left, and I want to read two quotes from the book that I particularly enjoyed and uh, tie them into another work of yours. The first, it goes like this. What is called planning in political rhetoric is the government's suppression of other people's plans by superimposing on them a collective plan created by third parties, armed with the power of government, and exempted from paying the cost that that these collective plans impose on others. You were talking about urban planning. That's a beautiful, beautiful quote. And then later on in discussing the complaints about CEO pay, you wrote, quote, perhaps the most fallacious assumption of all is that third parties with neither experience or expertise can make better decisions on the basis of their emotional reactions than the decisions of those who have both experience and expertise as well as a stake in the results. Now, you devoted an entire book, Knowledge of Decisions, to the challenge of making decisions that draw on knowledge, expertise, and experience that's scattered in the heads of numerous individuals that still gets used somehow without central planning. Tell our listeners a little bit about that book because uh, it's a really a wonderful book. Well, well th- th- thank you. Uh, I think one of the m- many fallacies of, of intellectuals is the assumption that they have more knowledge than other people. There's a certain specialized kind of knowledge of which that's true. Yeah, for sure. But the but the uh, knowledge that is consequential uh, does not consist just of that kind of knowledge. It consists of all I mean, just just knowing what a particular location is like can be worth millions of dollars. Uh, big uh, companies like uh, well, McDonald's is one. A uh, and P during its heyday, and I suspect Walmart today. Uh, they pick the location of their stores very carefully and invest a lot of time and money in, in, in making their choices. But that's just a very mundane kind of thing, and most people would not think of that as knowledge, but it has tremendous consequences. Many other kinds of uh, knowledge have all kinds of consequences, even though it's not the kind of knowledge that intellectuals specialize in. Now, that book, Knowledge and Decisions, draws heavily, as you uh, mentioned in the preface, on, uh, on Hayek. Yes. How, how did you get interested in Hayek? Uh, who? What did you read that got you interested, or what? Which professor? Well, you know, there, there was. Uh, uh, it's ironic because uh, I first uh, read a little Milton Friedman's course in price theory, his graduate course in price theory, had as one of his first assignments a little essay by Hayek called "The Use of Knowledge in Society," appeared in the American Economic Review sure. ages ago, nineteen forty-five. Uh, and uh, and the first time I read it, I saw no significance in it. <laughs> uh, and 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 I, the first time I, I was forced to think back on it uh, was when I first started uh, teaching, and I was uh, forced to teach a course on the Soviet economy. They assumed that because I had written about Karl Marx, that made me an authority on the Soviet economy, of which I knew nothing. Ironic, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but as I now am uh, making a huge uh, uh, effort to study this before time to teach the course, I'm struck by all kinds of strange things that happened in the Soviet economy that then immediately caused me to think back to what Hayek had said. And I realized they were trying to run an economy by people who didn't have as much knowledge as the people whose decisions they were superseding. And that this, this, this explained a very large percentage of the problems of the Soviet Union. And so from that 
sort of a germ, over the years I began to think about how is knowledge used in society. And so I think of uh, knowledge and decision as sort of a 400-page expansion of Hayek's 20-page uh, article. Yeah. I, in an earlier podcast with Vernon Smith, I'm, I made the same confession that I was assigned that book, not by Milton, but by, uh, I forget who, it's either uh, McCluskey or Herberg, it's probably McCluskey, and um, I read it, and I I didn't think much of it, to be honest, and now, yes. now I've read it, I think Vernon also, conf- he didn't confess he didn't get much out of it, but he did confess that he's read it many, many times since, with profit each time, it is a deceptively simple and uh, deep idea. And it also shows the, 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 the fallacy of trying to get teach students things that they will find relevant. I saw no relevance in that book, of that, in that article when I first read it. It's only after years later and, and, the, and, and some experience that now suddenly it becomes enormously relevant. Yeah. Other, other than Hayek, what are some of the other economists that have influenced uh, your thinking? Well, George Stigler, I guess, uh, but, uh, particularly on uh, the history of economic thought. And, uh, in fact, I, I went to Chicago specifically to study under George Stigler. In fact, I went to Columbia the year before to study under George Stigler, and when I got there and discovered that he'd gone to Chicago, <laughs> then I went to Chicago the very next year. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, now, you're not a big fan of those third-party planners uh, in, in the quote I read. Um, you wrote about them very eloquently in another book, which I, I want our listeners to, to be aware of, A Conflict of Visions. Yes. What's the conflict of visions? It, it, it's, it's the conflict, uh, ideological conflict, between those uh, who think that the world is uh, one in which you can make all kinds of decisions by third parties and a world in which you see the, the, the enormous difficulty of trying to do any such thing and, and the great danger that you'll make things worse when you're trying to make things better. Any other thoughts on that? Say, give us some more. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, if you believe that uh, the knowledge is concentrated in a handful of people, a relative handful of people, then, of course, there are all kinds of projects that make sense up to and including socialism. But if you think that the vast majority of the knowledge is scattered among hundreds of millions of people, uh, then if you transfer decision-making... Uh, from the from the ordinary person to these elites, you're transferring the knowledge, you're transferring the decision from where there's more knowledge to where there's less knowledge, but more presumption. Why do you think those utopian visions um, of the intellectuals are so um, seductive? Or let me ask it a different way. Why is economics, the lessons that you teach in your books, why are they so difficult for people to absorb? You know, one argument is is that well, economics is just hard. It's 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 a little bit complicated. The way it's taught at the graduate and even undergraduate level today is is quite a bit harder, I think, than it needs to be with mathematics. Yes. But you could argue it's just difficult. But I sense in your writing it's more than that. It's just difficult. It's um, we don't want to really learn those lessons. Do you think that's true? Yes. Uh, uh, economists are constantly saying there's no free lunch, but politicians keep getting elected by promising free lunch. I mean, I, I think Hillary Clinton's uh, ad showing her uh, with, with health care and things like that under the Christmas tree, so that she's playing essentially the role of Santa Claus. Uh, uh, that's what people uh, want. It's easier. It's uh, more satisfying. Uh, I think. I think. I think the economic explanations are unsatisfying. I think of FDR when he came in during the Great Depression, and uh, you know he blamed it on the economic royalists. Well, that, that may that may sound quite silly to an economist, uh, but it's it's more emotionally satisfying. You, you don't want to uh, find out that the Great Depression had to do with the monetary aggregates, uh, uh, tariff policy, and Federal Reserve uh, actions. I mean that's I mean what, whatever. Uh, even if you understood it easily and so forth, uh, it's not very emotionally satisfying. But when you say that someone has done something wrong and that he's going to come in and rescue from those evil people, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that, that, that sells politically. Yeah, I think we've done a very bad job as both economists and defenders of liberty and couching our arguments and appealing to the deeper uh, urges that people inevitably have. And I think that's a agenda for the future we could... We could do well to to try to improve. Yes. 
want to close with a, a topic that's, um, I think, surprised some of your fans. You have fans across a, a fairly wide uh, part of the political spectrum, but some of them agree very vehemently with you and disagree with you vehemently on the issue of immigration. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was surprised at, at your writing on this topic, and I'm curious, I'd like to hear your, you know, what I'm reading typically are 750 words in a in a newspaper, mm-hmm. which you do brilliantly, obviously. But I'm curious whether it's the illegality of immigration that worries you, or the impact of the immigrants. So, are you are you worried about the increase in immigration that we've seen in the last, say, 10, 15 years, or is that the nature of it that you're disturbed about? Uh, both. Uh, I think I'm also disturbed by the fact that people discuss immigration in general. When there is no such thing as an as, a, as an immigrant in general, there are some immigrants who come to this country who have been worth their weight in gold. I think of the people who came here uh, during the Second World War as a result of fleeing from the Nazis and who had played a major role uh, in creating the creating the atomic bomb, which undoubtedly saved the lives of a hundred thousand Americans. Uh, so there's no such thing as an immigrant in general. It's really a, a, another version of what, what I've said about uh, women and minorities, that uh, uh, they're, they're not homogeneous. Immigrants are not homogeneous. Uh, and insofar as the illegal, illegality means that we don't choose who's going to come here, people, people themselves decide whether they want to come here, and we have nothing to say about it. And, of course, that means we don't get the kind of immigrants who would uh, necessarily be best for the United States, but immigrants who are looking out for themselves, as people tend to do. Well, you talked about, in one piece I saw, you talked about gate crashers versus invited guests. That's right. And I guess my thought is is that for immigrants who work, which is a substantial number, they are invited guests by the people who employ them. So I would make a distinction at a minimum between people who come here without working and people who work. I mean, most immigrants that I know of, and I think it's true in the more general sense of the data, across all groups of immigrants, work very hard. And well, in the that country sense, doesn't, not only has to have workers, it has to have citizens. Uh, and I think that because economists in particular uh, tend, tend to uh, think in terms of the purely um, economic factor, uh, they're willing to let in people who, in fact, may be... May, may be um, hostile to the whole uh, society and culture of the country. And, of course, Europe has gotten itself into an enormous mess with the guest workers that they ha- have, who many of, many of whom are precisely that sort. I agree with that. I think Europe has a problem because their political system is, is not sufficiently uh, robust to absorb those, uh, those attitudes. Ours used to be. We've absorbed people from all over the world for 250 years Yes, um, who became Americans. And we had a constitution that limited the ability of groups to use political power in destructive ways, uh, voting blocks to be destructive in various ways. And people assimilated mostly, not totally, of course. And I wouldn't want them to myself. I, I love the cultural mix that is America. So is part of your concern the worry that the constitution is – been sufficiently watered down, and there's lots of evidence for that, of course, some of it in this book, uh, especially in the area of urban planning, property rights, but the Constitution has been sufficiently uh, watered down that that large influxes of people with different attitudes could be destructive? Uh, yes, but more than that, I, th- I think that the, the, that the views of Americans, and particularly of the intellectuals, uh, it's such that there's no thought that you have to protect the culture that exists here, uh, because as we multiculturalists tell us, uh, all cultures are equal. I don't know why people, th- why they think people are immigrating here in such huge amounts if all cultures are equal. Yeah. But that's the dogma. Yeah, my my hope is that uh, well, our culture is tr- American culture is truly multicultural, not the way the multiculturalists think of it, which is this culture and that culture, but rather a, a melding and mix and stew of, of different ideas and different food and different music and different art and creativity. Um, a lot of the, of the Internet's great success has come from immigrants. Uh, Andy Grove and uh, Sergey Brin are two that come to mind. So I, I, um, I, don't, I, don't, I, just, I'd like, I wonder if I'm more optimistic than you are that we're going to keep that culture that's so vibrant intact or you're afraid it's going to go off in the wrong direction. There are, there are too many forces uh, 
pushing it off in, in the wrong direction. I mean, we, we have people who think that uh, when someone commits a crime, according to American law, uh, which would not be a crime where they come from, that we should somehow uh, make allowances for that. Yeah. And, of course, what that means is that we're going to give up American law. Of course, yeah, and the flip side of that is this strange idea that if, if we have something that's legal here but illegal overseas, we shouldn't do it, uh, which is the, the, this idea that international law is somehow better. Uh, because oh, that, that, that's another scary uh, yeah. notion. Well, we're out of time. My guest today has been Thomas Soule, the Rosen Milton Friedman Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Dr. Soule, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I really hope you enjoyed that. If you made it to the end, type in the word GOAT for greatest of all time for Thomas Soule. I'm sure he loves seeing that. I wanted to talk very briefly about iTrust Capital. They are not a paid sponsor in any way. I recently set up an account with them and I could not be happier with their customer service, the quality of tokens, how quickly they were able to roll over my existing Roth IRA into their system. It has been incredible. I have a discount code for you and a link in the description. Just use basic economics. That will waive the first month of custodial fees. Again, I'm not an investment advisor but I do love their service. It is incredible. I love the idea of being able to purchase cryptocurrency within a Roth IRA and just let that thing grow tax-free. Also, I know many of you are into precious metals, gold and silver. You can actually hold physical gold and silver in your IRA or Roth IRA through this platform. Check it out. Let me know what you think. If you try them out, I am sure you're gonna be happy. Take care, everyone. Thank you again. If you're one of the millions of Americans who love investing in cryptocurrency, the IRS is targeting you. Thousands of scary letters from the IRS went out to cryptocurrency investors, saying they owe money for trades they never reported. That's because every time you buy, sell, or swap a cryptocurrency, it's a taxable event. Introducing iTrust Capital. iTrust Capital provides the simplest way to invest in cryptocurrency and not deal with the IRS iTrust Capital lets you do your trading within an IRA, so you don't have to pay taxes or report transactions when the funds are in the account. With just a 1% transaction fee, you can begin trading hassle-free 24 hours a day. $29.95 a month covers your IRA maintenance and unlimited institutional-grade storage with Curve. Check out iTrustCapital.com to learn how to avoid scary IRS letters from showing up in your mailbox. Have you been solicited by a gold IRA company? Most use the fear of losing your retirement account in the next financial crash and promise protection with physical gold. What they don't tell you is the coins they sell have huge markups. These companies employ commission salespeople who will say just about anything to get you to buy high-priced coins over low-cost bullion. They will push exclusive coins, low mintage, and proof coins, and say that these coins have special benefits like better appreciation, lower taxes, and privacy from government. Of course, these benefits rarely actually exist. The real reason they make these claims is to sell coins that are marked up 50 to 100 to 200 percent over their cost, making huge profits at your expense. So does gold really hedge against the dollar and economic uncertainty? Yes, but paying outrageous prices for coins in your IRA will not give you any protection and could drastically alter your retirement plan. So how can you put physical gold into your IRA without getting gouged? Introducing iTrust Capital. iTrust Capital offers physical gold in your IRA at only $50 over spot per ounce. iTrust Capital utilizes vault chain gold, which gives clients the ability to buy and sell physical gold stored at the Royal Canadian Mint 24-7. Clients place trades through iTrust's interface and executes through Precious Metals Leader Kitco. To learn more, go to itrustcapital.com and get your free gold IRA insider's report now.